Welcome to the Connoisseur Conversations with A. Lange und Söhne. My name is Karl Norton and I have the honor to host the upcoming 30 Minutes, where we will focus on iconic design. When a value or a meaning of design is understood, shared and mutually agreed by a large group of people, it really becomes an icon. Uh, the Eames chair, for example, a Porsche 911, a A. Lange und Söhne Lange 1. They're examples of iconic designs we easily recognize. But what does make a design memorable? And how can design influence us and can set benchmarks for years and decades to come? This conversation shall try to answer questions like these. And I have the honor to welcome the CEO from A. Lange und Söhne, Wilhelm Schmidt, live here in the studio. Hi, everybody. Hi, Wei. Hi, Ted. <laughs> They're already applauding. Connected to us via video call, you see, I welcome Wei Ko, the founder <laughs> of Revolution Magazine and The Rake, who is connected to us from Singapore. And Tad Gushu, editor, writer, photographer, and independent digital media consultant, who was executive editor for Petrolicious.com and the founder and executive editor of Supercompressor.com. Welcome, gentlemen. It's a true honor to have you here for this remote conversation. Absolute pleasure, sir. Thank pleasure you so much for having us. Excellent. Now, uh, we're talking about iconic design. And in my introduction, I already mentioned cars as well as furniture, but also naturally watches. Um, when, it, when it's about cars, um, and obviously people know that you're a connoisseur of cars as well, is there any specific vehicle that you think is that's just the most iconic one that I have at the moment? I think that's the most difficult question <laughs> because there are so many nice cars and some I can afford and others I can't, so uh, they will be on the ever wish list but okay. never materialized. I... <clears throat> I there is a beauty in many cars, but, you know, I think taste and design and what you like also goes hand in hand. And some people like, you know, the, the very modern cars, other like even the pre-war cars. And, and, and then there are the guys that love the 50s and the 60s. That's unfortunately very much me. Right. Um, I, I, but but I, I think that's, there are designs where everybody will agree that is beautiful. You know, take a DB5, Aston Martin, a Porsche 911, um, a, a, Lamborghini, a Lamborghini Miura. I think regardless what sort of era you like, you look at these cars and, and you will say yeah, that's, you know, that's an icon because right. it just represents a certain period of time the best way possible. Right. So, so you mentioned, and I think we even have a picture of you and your uh, 911 um, that actually shows that you know, you look really good next to an icon because you're an icon yourself. No, right? no, 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 <laughs> not at all. But uh, and I'm not a Porsche man. I have to say that. Right. Uh, it was just, but that particular car in this particular color combination right. um, that made me going for a Porsche. Ah. The one thing I have to admit, I wasn't a Porsche fan at all. Right. But after I had that car and and drove it, and it's been used quite a bit. Right. Well, these German things, they, it's not just design, it's also function. They work all the time. They drive absolutely beautifully. Okay. It's not only the design, it's also the functionality that comes with that specific car, which makes it a keeper. Right, okay. Uh, and while, while Waco is turning himself into an icon by smoking on a morning show, uh, because it's, it's, early, <laughs> it's early hours here in, in Germany. Not in Singapore. <laughs> I think he is a little bit ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> and he celebrates in style too. Uh, but I, I happen to uh, have stumbled upon a picture from uh, Ted, you, uh, with your favorite Porsche. And it's a very specific model. It's a 911 built in 1976. 
What does that one, what does this one set apart from the rest? Why is this the icon of the icons for you? Well, you're making it sound like I had a choice in uh, in choosing it, uh, which is sadly not the case. Um, this was the car that my father purchased when I was about three years old, three to four years old, and it was the car I was raised in. Uh, this was quite literally, I spent my formative years in the back seat, cramped in there, kicking the seat, scratching it, uh, destroying the headliner. Uh, this, this was a car that was used on the weekends, uh, that was used during the week by my dad commuting to work. It was a huge part of our family, and uh, when I moved to Los Angeles to, to take over as uh, editor-in-chief of Petrolicious, um, my, my father was really sentimental about the car, and, but he handed me the keys and said, if you have this car, you'll be able to do your job in a way that if you don't have it, I don't think you ever will. And he gave it to me, and, uh, so, and, I, and he was completely right, because when I arrived in, uh, in Los Angeles, I had a classic car and I was able to become an editor of a classic car magazine in a much more organic and natural way because I was actually part of the community in a literal sense, not just in a fan sense, like I'd always been. You know, much like I'm sure Way, you know, if you, if you go to a watch conference without wearing a watch, you, it's kind of awkward, uh, if that makes sense. So I think that there's a lot to be said for, you know, walking the walk and talking the talk. And this car became part of my identity through that process. Um, but this was not a collector's car to us. It was, you know, I think my father paid 5,000 US for it when it was uh, in the early 90s. So these, these were decisions made because they were fun cars. And, and they become personal icons as well, just, just like you described with your 911. Now, uh, over to Singapore, I mean, with, with Revolution and The Rake, you have two magazines that really celebrate the style that you live from morning to night, so to speak. Um, what, in your eyes, what makes an icon or what makes a product or, or something that we use in our daily lives become an icon? Uh, well, thank you, Carl, for asking that question. You know, for me, I think it is usually something that's created by one or a small group of individuals that have this extraordinary desire to create something that is a personal expression of who they are. So related to the 9-11, you know, that's uh, Boots and Porsche. Um, and I think that, and incidentally, I, I, you know, like everyone else in this in this conversation, had a had an old 911 at one point. When I first moved to Los Angeles, I, I bought a 1979 930 Turbo, which was a car that basically tried to kill me on a daily basis. Um, but it was the car that I had a poster of over my bed when I was a boy. And I think it's it's the capacity for things to make us dream that is so extraordinary. And the 911 um, certainly is one of those. Related to Langa, and maybe we can talk about the Langa one first in its status as an icon since it was the first watch or one of the first four watches created in 1994. I know that you guys happen to be in Berlin, and for me to really understand the Langa one and its status as an icon, I needed to visit Berlin. So I went there and I had dinner uh, with my friend Tim Rao at his restaurant, and he said, I want to bring you to someplace very special. So he brought me the next day to um, Axel Springer's building. Right? So this is a building that was built in 1959, and Axel Springer, who was a legend in the publishing industry, intentionally built this building right next to the Soviet border. Right? He, could have, he could have built it anywhere he wanted. He could have built it in the wealthiest part, but he built it right next to the Soviet border, the place where you know, several years later you would have the Berlin Wall. And why did he do this? It's because he believed in reunification. And he believed that one day when Germany was reunited, as it was in 1989, he would therefore have a building that was in the center of Berlin, not just in the former West uh, Berlin. And he felt that the German people reunited could create extraordinary things, right? Could create things that would be market leading, world leading. And so then cut to, um, you know, the 1989 when the reunification happens and you have this extraordinary man named Gunther Blumlein. Who, meets, who finds another extraordinary man named Walter Lange, right? And together they, um, they, they, they create the renaissance for a Lange and Son. And, but in order to do that, they have to create one watch that will forever change the minds of everyone in terms of what a, a watchmaking icon can be. And it had to be a watch that had the language, a design language that was completely unique, that had never existed before, right? In order for them to do that. So if you look at the history of Lange pocket watches, for example, what you'll see is a lot of the vocabulary in terms of the movements, in terms of the three-quarter plate, in terms of the chaton, in terms of the jewels, in terms of the engraved balance cock, in terms of the swan neck regulator, that's all there. But what you don't have is the design of the Lange One. That was created by Walter Lange 
and by Clifford Blumlund, right? And how did they do that? Because they wanted to create something that represented a reunited Germany, right? They wanted to show what the German people were capable of, the beauty they were able to express. And they started with one small detail, which was the five minute clock in the Dresden Opera House, right? And they decided to transform that into the oversized date. And because that date took so much space, they had to offset the, the, the subdial for the hours and the minutes, and then they had to offset again the subdial for the seconds. And I know that when you do your presentation, there's a, a picture of that isosceles triangle that occupies the central points of the date, the subdial for the hours and the subdial for the seconds, because he created a watch that is asymmetrical, but yet the most symmetrical watch conceivable, because it, it's so balanced. And I think it was this incredible motivation to create something that expressed their country coming back together, the beauty that these people were able to do that made the, the, the long one such an icon. So I'm sorry for uh, my very long uh, story, but there you go. <laughs> you can actually have my job where you do it perfect. I'm going for our icons job, actually. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Excellent. And, and I'm glad that we uh, talk about watches because I've got one on my wrist and I, I, I felt a bit left out about the cars because I'm, I felt the peer <laughs> pressure building up. So I need one of those now. But uh, seriously, I mean, that's that's just that was uh, a really a very fascinating praise uh, and history, historical truth, how the design becomes reality. Now, you've been at the helm of uh, Al Lange und Söhne for 10 years. Um, so you lived with these icons. Um, would you say that every watch family that, that Arlange und Söhne thinks of, conceives and turns into real products is geared to be icons? Look, it, it, we never talk ourselves about icons okay. because I think icons are not... You, you can't plan for an icon. It's not in your hands, actually. Right. You can do your very best... Um, And, and, and you have to go off the beaten track to do that because otherwise you are one of many right. and you are not the one that can create something. That, that's, the big, that's the big difference. And the moment you really go out of your comfort zone and sometimes you even go out of the comfort zone of what is technically possible at that moment in time and you manage not only the technical aesthetics, but also, you know, the dial aesthetics, and you get that in the right, then probably you have the ingredients for something that will, you know, not become zeitgeist, that will be there forever. Um, and, and automatically, if you go for, just say, a three-hand watch, that becomes very difficult because there's so much you can do with three hands, And to, to, to do that differently than right. all the other three-hand watches is actually, from a design perspective, a huge challenge. There are, there are watches, if I take the 1815 Thin that we launched last year, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's an icon, don't get me wrong, guys, but I think that's a watch that even if you take the logo away, you would immediately say that's an Alanga und Söhne. Right. And that is what we want to achieve. Whether that becomes later on an icon is not in our hands. It's actually in the hands of very many other people, and that's why we just do the best to keep the design integer for that family. So for an 1815, we will always have the Arabic numbers. Right. And no outsized date, by the way. Okay. Um, so th that's pretty clear. That's a design definition of that family, and whatever we do has to fit into that design family. Um, And then you have these, in the beginning, usually hugely controversial launches, like the Zeitwerk or the Odysseus. Okay. Um, the Zeitwerk, now 10 years later, still nobody is copying that, right. which is always a good sign. Um, so that probably has the potential in 10, 15 years, uh, and today, if you <coughs> ask to expert, you take the logo away and ask, you know, who produced that watch, everybody will tell it's Lange und Söhne. Right. That, I think, is more important for us. The rest, we will see. Okay. Right. But there's, there's one thing that um, when Waiko interviewed you just a, a short while ago, um, and it was about the digital edition, obviously, of Watches and Wonders, and, and that made me think um, whether Ted could um, bring, shed some light on, on one, one aspect. Now that everything gets more and more digital, that we get more and more into a media uh, 
I don't know, opulence uh, with Instagram, with all these, these visual outlets that we have, does the, the digital media play a big, bigger role nowadays in creating an icon willfully than it should have, uh, could have done like 10, 20 years ago? I was speaking to uh, a great deal of friends of mine who are very passionate about watches, and uh, and we've got Wayne and I have a lot of friends in common who are now all sitting around their laptops and staring at their Zoom calls and and really trying to absorb everything from watches and wonders. And I know for a fact that all of us uh, who are all passionate about the releases coming out of watches and wonders are like we could easily just get this from Instagram because that's how we're consuming it as consumers, anyways. So the, the nature of a three-dimensional or even a, a virtual uh, trade show is completely revolutionizing as we speak. Uh, but what I think it's doing is, is creating a craving for us to get back to a three-dimensional uh, experience. You know, I, I can't say that there's a single person in this room that wouldn't rather be having this conversation or over a drink together uh, in person. So I think we're, we're, we've now reached such a saturation of digital experience where we're just happy to the, 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 for the prospect of seeing anyone in, in person and uh, would be desperate to do so and and actually something i was just thinking about while you were talking about your last point of creating icons by doing something different uh something that i really uh, i really admire about Langenzona is that this is a brand that has no motorsport heritage has no connection to the automotive world intrinsically yet be because of the passion of, of Willem and because of the way in which you guys have created the patronage of some of the world's most incredible three-dimensional events, uh, like um, Concourse de la Ganza, Villa de Este, uh, or the, um, the, the, the concourse that happened in the UK, you've now be created a, a real brand by doing something completely unexpected. And now when I think about automotive watches, actually I do think about uh, the Longo one because it is the watch you win when you win Villa de Este. So you've created something so special that is so tied to a three-dimensional event. And it, you know, I, all I can do is, is just look at my Zoom screen and wish that we were all back on Lake Como together, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too, Ted, me too. And, and talking about Zoom, uh, dear uh, viewers, if you, if you wonder where Ted is and whether that is a virtual Zoom background that he's using. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> he's actually out and about in Sardinia, so that's uh, um, turning himself into uh, an icon with, with the first real background that uh, outshines any kind of virtual background you can think of. Yeah, making me very jealous. <laughs> uh, but back to the topic. It's very windy today. Yeah, we, we, noticed. <laughs> we noticed. We um, noticed. So, so we, um, when you look at, at Asia in contrast to, to uh, Europe, because you're at home in both hemispheres, so to speak, um, is it any different how icons are being perceived in, in Singapore, for example, compared to um, London or the UK? That's an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, you know, I would say 10 years ago, I, I, I think different nationalities, different countries had a penchant for different types of watches. And I think in particular in, in Northern Asia, in China, there were specific brands and specific types of watches. That, that did very well. Um, but we live in a very different age. We live in an age of interconnectivity, and we live in an age where a single image or a single video can be broadcasted through social media and reach the entire world in a matter of seconds. And one of the byproducts of this is that we've had a global alignment of taste. So I would say today, the watch that's popular in Singapore is also the watch that's popular in the United States, and it's also the watch that's popular in the Middle East, and also the watch that's popular in China, right? And I think that's good, actually, because uh, it's a level playing field and everyone can um, immerse themselves in, in, in understanding those watches, in being engaged in a knowledge-based hobby, and then making their own conclusions. But what I see is there's a global consensus forming, right? And I, back to what Ted was saying related to Lana and how it has captured the imagination of a lot of people who like motorsports, um, I think it's because of the excellence of the engineering. Right? I think anyone that loves cars or motorcycles is also interested in engineering. And if you look at um, Alanga, and especially if you look at it in the context of the early 90s, 1994, when it was first launched uh, uh, with four amazing watches, including the Pour Mary Tourbillon, which is to this day the most, one of the most staggering watches ever created. The first watch with a chain and fuse um, and a tourbillon, of course. Uh, and if you look in particular, I would say in, in 1999, when Alana created the datograph, which I feel is probably the most iconic modern chronograph that's today, 
what they achieved in terms of movements, what they achieved in terms of internal content um, is, is mind blowing. So I would say, you know, it's one thing to have an icon in terms of its design, but no icon can be a real icon without substance, right? So you can't have um, a Porsche without a flat city, right? Or I guess you could have the, the four-cylinder engine if it's a 356 or a 912, but it's the flat six that everyone thinks of as being that icon, right? In the same way, you can't have Lang and Son, and you can't have the Lang One, and you can't have the Data Graph without those extraordinary movements as well. The first, I think, the, the first double-barrel serially produced movement, movement um, in 1994, the Lang One, and the Data Graph. I mean, just light years ahead of everything else that was being created. The entire industry was still relying on the Le Mans 2310 for their chronograph during the period when the, the data graph was launched. That's a movement that was created in the 1940s. So, so Lana has been ahead in terms of content since the time it was launched. Okay, so it's, it's style and substance, um, and of course function, which you, which you addressed in the beginning. Um, now just bouncing that back, because Wei just, Wei just said, um, there is a globalization in taste, so to speak, if I you know, make this mm. really short. Is that what, what you experience as well when you speak with customers and enthusiasts from different parts of the world? Or, or, or are there different, do they find different icons in your families? Look, it's, it's, on the one hand, it's a lot easier today, and on the other hand, it's a lot more difficult. Um, it is easier because everything you do um, is available globally more or less on the spot. That's the easy part. The more difficult part is to distinguish from all the others in that moment and what you do. Right. And I think that's a lot more challenging today than it was probably ever before. Um, and again, the two gentlemen, because we know, we know each other so well and we talked a lot about it, I share with you the biggest challenge for us. Um, and, and you are a custodian of that, because if, if Wade talks about Alanga und Söhne, you can feel that he's is more a protector, a custodian than, than anything else. Um, but, you know, we are almost like a secret club right. um, because we only produce five and a half thousand watches a year and we want to remain that secret club. Um, but at the same time, now everything is available and viewable for so many people. Right. How, do we, how do we keep the balance of being a secret club on the one hand, um, and, and on the other hand, you know, you can't do that really anymore in, 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 in today's world. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of our biggest challenge, why I love your dog. Uh, <laughs> if I could do that with mine, I had about 30 kilo on my lap, so it doesn't work. You're a lot more clever in the choose of the size of your dog. <laughs> Well, you know, since we were talking about uh, icons of German design, I thought I would put, show my, my dachshund. <laughs> See, that's, that's the first time I, there was a proper reason for any animal to show up in a video call. <laughs> Excellent. It's design. It's style meets purpose. Um, that's very interesting. But what I, I think is... One? Yeah, sure, go ahead. So one thing that really, when we talk about the meaning of the word icon, you know, and I hear Wade talk about the, the mechanisms that make a long and so important. I come to it from a very different perspective. You know, when I first discovered the Lago One and first met Willem, I didn't know uh, why the internals of the watch were so special. I just objectively loved the watch immediately, the second I saw it. So that to me indicates that there's two different types of icons. You know, we've got Waco's internal knowledge and the way he understands the mechanisms uh, like it's part of his own body. And then you've got someone like me who just sees it and just goes, dang, that's really cool. And it's just, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's as objective as uh, like seeing a Rolex GMT or something like that. You just go, ah, wow, that, that's cool. I get it. And that, to me, is what has always signified being an icon. And, uh, and I think that's just the really how, how distilled we can get it is, is, to me, what makes an icon. Right, okay. So, so the one thing is for sure there's many different ways people perceive a product or, or an experience that turns it into a common icon. 
Um, but when I sort of what strikes me is that what we talk about really is the past. An icon is a result of what happened in the past. As I said, you can't plan for an icon. Whoever says that, I think that's uh, actually the opposite is right. Because okay. usually something that is completely out of the, at the time of launch common taste, that has a chance to become an icon. Right. The others are just follow-up. So if somebody plans for an icon, I don't think that's, that's possible. Okay. Because it will only develop over time, and it has to be hugely different to the then normal product at the time of launch. Right. Um, and the difference has to fulfill a purpose um, and has to have a real benefit. Right. And that benefit also has to be maintained over time. I think then you sort of have the ingredients of, of something that will, you know, last right. um, and will be perceived as, I want that watch or I want that car or I want that chair. Uh, that, that I think, and that is very difficult, and, and therefore I don't believe you can plan it. Right, right. I mean, but looking at the, at the families and, for example, the Odysseus, which is really when it started and it was a steel model, that was breaking with tradition, that was... Um, one could have thought, oh, they're doing this intentionally so that they sort of break with our expectations and that way they want to push it and create an icon. But that's not true at all then, judging from what you just said. No, it was a long work um, and Wayne knows exactly how long it was because he was actually one of the ever first people to see the prototypes. Right. Um, and that was about a year before the launch, uh, was in January 2019. Right. And we launched it at the 24th of October. Um, I think it was the bravest step we did actually in my time, because if you come with something which is so radical, breaking with what you stand for, right. you better make sure there is enough in the watch that still is associated very clearly with what you stand for. Um, and, and whether that watch will become, I don't know. I just know there is still a big debate. <laughs> there are haters and lovers. And I think that also is important that in the beginning it is not perceived as just beautiful. Right. Because I do not believe that an icon has been beautiful in the beginning. It has to be controversial in the beginning. That I also believe is something which all, which all icons or watches or objects that you later on call an icon have in common. They were actually perceived very controversial in the beginning. A 9-11... Uh, there was not a lot of applaud in the beginning. Uh, that's why they were so careful with it. So that, again, is a typical sign. They broke all rules. They did it definitely different to what they did before or what did exist in those days in the car industry. And if you put them next to each other today, you just see that they, they increase the size, but you can still recognize the same, the same uh, design. Uh, and again, I think it, it takes that... Break the mold, right. be brave, go different ways, um, and, and, and still do it in the way that people think you should do it. I believe then you have something which, which, which may be good. Okay. Just before we, we have a final round, because you, uh, you, you mentioned that Wei was one of the first people to see the Odysseus. Yes. What was your, what was your initial uh, thinking around this, this, this product or this timepiece, one should rather say? Um, okay, before I answer that, I just want to mention, um, I actually completely agree with what Ted said. For you to um, forge a connection with the watch, the response has to be emotional first. You have to look at it, and whether that's the dial side or the movement side, and you have to have an emotional reaction to it that is instinctive, and that, that and, and you fall in love with it, right, as you would a, a human being. And, and uh, you know, for me, that's the moment in which I couldn't understand contemporary art anymore, was the moment in which I had to read a pamphlet in order to understand the art. I feel that you should look at it and you should feel engaged and you, you, should, you should immediately love it, right? Second of all, I completely agree with what Willem said about icons because, and I love the fact that throughout this entire conversation about icons, Willem has never referred to any of his own watches as icons because you as the creator of a watch or a creator of anything cannot say it's an icon. It is only other people that can say it's an icon. Journalists like myself and Ted that can say it's an icon, and in which case, uh, related to um, the manga, certainly there are many iconic watches there. So finally, related to the Odysseus, when I looked at it, I was startled, 
surprised, and yet somehow I loved it, right? Um, and and it was it, it, because, and I love the fact that it was in some ways unexpected because in my mind, when Willem had said he wanted to do an integrated bracelet steel sports watch, I basically thought it was going to be kind of like a, you know, the Lana ones come on a Wellendorf bracelet, you know, the beautiful sort of like um, a brick link bracelet. And I thought it was just going to be a more sporty version of that. The fact that he took it to the next level and created something completely different. And then also took uh, advantage of this idea of the, the big date, but then integrated the days of the week on the other side as well. And then created this, because all the greater Lanas always have a little touch of asymmetry. And the fact that the case is asymmetrical, I loved as well. I just thought it was really cool. And I thought it was courageous during a period where people in some ways had lack, had lack courage in terms of creating watches. And, and I really respected it, uh, I'm willing for that. As to whether or not it's a, a success, I have a very simple uh, um, answer for that. The point is no one can get one. So <laughs> when you have a watch that no one can buy because it's so, it's so out of stock, uh, I would say it's been successful. Will, Willem, would you agree? Uh, I never received more complaints about not getting a watch than with this one, I have to say. Right. And I do apologize for it. It's not, it's not a marketing trick. Uh, it is just, uh, it was a, a tough year for our people in the manufacturing, as you can imagine. Uh, we launched the watch and then came uh, the pandemic with all the implications it still has on uh, the, the factory because we have to protect our people. Uh, so that was not without uh, challenges and, and the demand literally from the word go was a lot bigger than what we ever dreamed uh, to have. Um, and, you know, I always say we have five and a half thousand watches production a year. It takes us 500 people to do that. Um, I cannot produce 6,000 tomorrow unless I find another 50 people that can do the job for me. It's not robots, it's not machines, they can work eight hours, um, and, 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 and the result of these eight hours are the five and a half thousand watches. So I hope everybody accepts my apologies, uh, but at the moment, uh, you know, the demand is outstripping so big, and it's not only for that, it's also funny enough for the longer one, um, it, 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 we have to deal with it, and it's not going to change in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. So thanks for that hint, Wade. It gives me a <laughs> chance to apologize to all those that are waiting for their watches. Plus, he said it in the most elegant way. Never has a watch been more out of stock. I just, I just love that expression. <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's just perfect. Um, now, we have to also congratulate you on being the, uh, the the only watchmaker in the industry who didn't release a green watch this year. <laughs> you know me, Ted. Sometimes brands are um, as much defined by the things they do as by the things they don't do. <laughs> right. Bravo. Not not having done that this year will will make you even more iconic. I guess it will. Stand the test of time to not have released that watch. Um, talking about the test of time, uh, I can see a, a big clock, a digital one, very not nice. It's ugly actually because it's it's actually showing me that we have no time left. You know, we ran out of time talking about icons. Um, but it was just great that you took your time um, and and dived into the topic and really shared with us what do you think makes iconic designs and there's so many perspectives it's the handwerkskunst as they say in german it's the the heritage the passion the story the substance so there's so many things and then there's no wonder that you cannot calculate that um, and i want to thank you very much for for bringing all this together for bringing it to life uh, what what makes an icon um, and of course i want to say thank you to you for sharing some of your personal pictures about uh, the cars and and for for sharing and being so open about what it is that drives our Lange und Söhne. Thanks a lot, friends. Uh, There's a fair chance that we're going to see each other this year in person and not on the screen. Uh, can't wait for it. Yeah. We're uh, on our way to Sardinia as we speak, <laughs> <laughs> which is why we'll now have to uh, <laughs> end the show. Thank you very much to all the viewers and, of course, to you two and to you, Willem Schmidt. Stay healthy, stay safe, and bye see bye. you soon. Cheers, cheers, bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, guys. Pleasure.